All Nations Bible Translation partners with churches to send teams who facilitate Bible translation and community development while working to establish indigenous churches. We believe that the church has been commissioned of God to send those He calls to carry the gospel to foreign lands to establish His kingdom there. Therefore, we partner with local churches instead of sending teams out ourselves because as a parachurch organization we are simply called to be a servant to the church in her mission. Providing educational resources is one of the ways that All Nations desires to partner with the Church in the process of bringing God's Word to those who are still waiting to hear. One of our immediate goals along this line is to provide a collection of church planting resources for the congregations who will give oversight to the church planting teams sent in partnership with All Nations. We pray that this panel discussion, recorded at All Nations Camp Week 2020, could be a means to that end. Clyde has worked in church planting in a Muslim country in Southeast Asia and around the world with CAM's microfinance SALT program. He recently agreed to serve as an advisor for all nations. He also works as the consultant for our teams who establish a SALT program. Jay has worked for over 30 years in missions, starting out in Southern Africa under Campus Crusade and SIM, and then in Indonesia with Charity Christian Mission. For the past five years, Jay and his wife Amy have been serving in Southern Africa. However, they are not currently able to return to their home in Mozambique due to an ISIS takeover in the area earlier this year. Ken spent time as a young man in northwestern Ontario working with First Nations people. He served short term in Kenya with Amish Mennonite aid where he encountered a near-death experience at the hands of an angry mob. Ken's family moved to Ireland to serve with Mission Interest Committee in 2012 but needed to unexpectedly return. He joined the All Nations Board in 2019. Harold worked in Central America with Mennonite Fellowship Missions as a young man, and later, after marriage, his family served in Ukraine with Masters International Ministries. He joined the work of All Nations Bible Translation in 2011, participating in several early survey trips in the South Pacific. In 2020, Harold accepted the request to serve as board chairman. Joel, as a single, began to feel called to pursue training for Bible translation. However, he soon realized that if he and his friends wanted to do Bible translation and church planting, there simply was not an organization available to send them that would support teaching all things as the Anabaptist vision understands it. In 2010, he helped to start All Nations Bible Translation, where he has served since. It's been a blessing to be together here this week and in a lot of ways we're kind of wrapping up with this session thankful for four brothers here that have committed to participating in what can be a somewhat vulnerable experience sitting together talking in public about our views their views when it comes to a, a subject that is uh, obviously there's a lot of different perspectives on how churches should be planted, how discipleship should look, and we've already heard a good bit about that today so far. The title for this session is Tradition and Innovation when it comes to a church planting paradigm. We've asked each of them to have a five minute opening statement, so our goal with this is to kind of set a context in which we can begin to like setting out some of the boundary markers on a ball field. We have to know kind of what we're aiming for if we're going to hit something. So each of these brothers is going to have a five minute opening statement. Uh, first of all, we'll look to Brother Ken to talk briefly about a scriptural foundation for church planting. Second of all, historical background, looking at the history of church planting briefly by Brother Jay Smoker. Third, Clyde Zimmerman will speak to us a bit about his personal experience with church planting and his involvement in uh, discipleship around the world. And then finally, we'll look to Brother Harold Troyer to talk to us about unreached people group uh, principles, looking at the principles that would be specific to our specific context as All Nations Bible Translation prepares to go. So each of you brothers, if you could come up in that order, I'll let you take the platform here and we'll present in that order. The Pilgrim Church as a disciple 
making community exists as a result of God's age-old covenant with his people. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The apostle Peter applies the language of God's covenant with Israel to the new people of God, the New Testament church, as follows. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are. And the mother passages from which many of these phrases were taken from are lifted out of Exodus 19.6 and Deuteronomy 26.18. Paul's description of the church in 1 Corinthians 6.16-18 6, as the temple of God is also replete with Old Testament references to Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And he says there, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. Those are Old Testament phrases which Paul uses to describe the church. The Pilgrim Church is made up of expatriates presently living outside their native country. But our citizenship is in heaven. From, from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said in Philippians 4.2. So both Peter and Paul use descriptions first applied to the nation of Israel to describe the church, such as a chosen race, a nation set apart for God's own treasured possession. Both Peter and Paul understood the church to be a family of expatriates with their citizenship in another world. Now the mission of the church then the biblical foundation for church planting is to make new disciples and organize them, or should say order them into communities within this new nation race as citizens of a new world. This is church planting. So what is the biblical method of accomplishing this? I have two points here. One is through intensive companionship. Now we see this in the scriptures through the example of Jesus and Paul and others. Disciples are made through intensive companionship. I quote Curie Villa, page 35. Discipling is a spiritually mature person providing intensive companionship and instruction to a person seeking a new way of life. And disciples are made as new converts spend much time with people who have godly lives worth emulating. And both Jesus and Paul modeled this. For example, Jesus spent three years with 12 men. And if the Son of God spent essentially all of his time for over three years with a small group of people, dare we imagine that, we, that through far less time and effort, we can make disciples. Paul's missionary travels throughout the Mediterranean region are used as a model for church planting. Often overlooked are his extended stays among new believers for the purpose of discipling them. One of many examples is the Thessalonian church. Intense companionship as a disciple-making method is modeled here in this verse. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. There we have it. Uh, an example of creating um, followers of the Lord Jesus. The church was Paul's family. He nurtured his family like a mother and father nurtured their children. But we were gentle among you in the same passage there in 1 Thessalonians, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. You are witnesses, God, also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know that like a father with his children, we exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you and so on. The kind of parental guidance isn't possible outside the intense companionship of the discipling family. So working day and night, Paul proclaimed the gospel and as Paul traveled, he preached and taught while he practiced his trade. And he modeled the gospel by word and example. And along the way, some people were converted. And through intense companionship, Paul worked to bring them into Christ's likeness. Now, there, people are made into disciples, not only through intense companionship, but in the context of strong group church community. In the rhythms of daily life among individual members of the community and in the gatherings of the community, disciples are made through teaching and preaching the word through the sacraments or the ordinances, through prayer, study of the word, practical obedience, through working together in daily life, through rebuke, correction, discipline, use of the gifts, confession of sins, brotherhood hermeneutic in interpreting and, and applying the scriptures through submission and above all else and in everything, love. Now, the, I have a question. Jesus and Paul had some advantages. 
They both worked with near cultures, Hebrew and Greek. They shared the mother tongue languages with their, so to speak, target groups, Hebrew and Greek. My question is, in closing, how will all nations model after the biblical patterns of Jesus and Paul and the New Testament strong group church community if all nations personnel are crossing cultures to cultures very much unlike their own? Well, uh, looking at uh, church planting from a historical perspective, uh, my burden is twofold here today. First, that we understand some of the principles of how to plant indigenous churches. Um, we need to unpack that term a little bit along the way. Uh, this involves having clear goals, involves practical principles and how to get there. And history is a great teacher. I think we can learn a lot from tradition. We can learn a lot from other people's experiences and other people who have studied or have gone before us. Church planning is a long-term process as we've already heard here today. And critical mistakes are often very difficult to correct along the way. Uh, we often refer to, so what I'm referring there is that we need to start off on the right foot as best as we can. We often refer to following an indigenous church planting model and I believe we would do well to unpack that term. Uh, we won't have time to do all of that here today, but there are books and other resources available to do that. But what does it look like to have a self-supporting church, a self-governing church, and a self-propagating church, one that multiplies itself? I have a little book here called Lancaster's uh, Mennonite Safari, which is the history of the Lancaster Conference Mennonites that went out to Tanzania in the year 1933. And one of the things I learned from that lesson and from David Shank, who is still living, who wrote that book, is that they knew very well these indigenous principles of church planning when they went out there. One of the things we can learn is that their home churches did not. And their mission boards partially did. And some of the things that happened along the way that were very challenging to them. So things like that we can learn from. Um, we can look at what's happened through other conservative churches here. There's books and things that were already referred to here uh, this week about that and many other helpful resources. For example, Roland Allen has done some uh, study and writing about the, what happened during the whole colonization process uh, when uh, many of these countries in uh, South America or even especially Africa and Asia were divided up and became colonies of European and the Western world uh, nations. Uh, what was the, we can look at the mission compound model, uh, mission schools, clinics, hospitals, and how these, affect, how these affected the establishing of churches. Uh, we could also explore the meaning of words like indigenous, paternalism, dependency, and syncretism, which is also going to be probably more than we can do here today. The other area of burden that I bring here is the whole community development thing, which we've all been, also been talking about this week uh, from my experience, but it covers a broad range of things like literacy training, educational programs, dealing with medical needs, agricultural resources, and like we heard, uh, economic issues like microfinance, etc. I'm just gonna share here in closing two different scenarios with development type approaches. How many of you are familiar with the United Mission to Nepal? Nepal was a closed country, very closed. Uh, proselytizing and evangelism was completely prohibited, but a group of missions was able to enter that country and do development projects. And through the different missions and missionaries that went there, even though they were prohibited from doing any kind of evangelism through the influence of projects in the community, built relationships, people got converted, and it's incredible what is happening there today. So they started just on the basis of community development, God blessed it, and today we see a lot of fruit. I know of a missionary who went to a, a Muslim tribe in Malawi whose wife was a medical doctor, and they decided when they went there that she was not going to practice medicine because they did not want people coming to them for what they could get or they didn't want to develop rice Christians because of uh, the benefits they would get from that particular service. And they today also have seen people come to know the Lord. 
Very different approaches. And in summary here, it sums up what Brother Clyde uh, said at the end. We really need to trust the Spirit of God to lead us and direct us in all this. There is not a, a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, my guess is I'm the least qualified to speak on, on this topic, so I'll, I'll learn with the rest of you. Um, just a, a little bit more in, in my um, maybe introduction or, or my experiences. Um, over the last 10 years, I've had the blessings of being able to work with numerous Anabaptist missions. And as you can imagine, there are many different um, methods and means that are used um, to sh share the gospel from uh, the traditional build the compound, go build church and invite people in. Um, that's maybe on one equation and, and all the way on the other equation is we never really do much of anything other than say, yeah, do you believe the Lord? And I believe that, that um, both of those extremes have, uh, have pretty serious limitations. Um, I have worked in, in Latin America a little bit, in Haiti, um, Uganda, and some in the African context. But most of my experience comes from Asia, India, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Bangladesh, and more recently, Indonesia and Grenada. So seeing other missions utilize various methods to endeavor to be the hands and feet of Jesus and has, has been a tremendous blessing uh, to me to observe and learn and wrestle with these things. And seeing God move and, and call men and women to him has been a tremendous inspiration in my own faith. Um, in some of my personal experience, it's like, the more you see God move, you soon realize the people you're working with, God has had on a journey many years, perhaps 10 years before they were exposed to Christianity. And then through natural disasters and events that only God in heaven can orchestrate, there we are walking with those folks. And how did that happen? None of us could even begin to put that together. And the analogy I like to think about is there's a train going by and there God has allowed us to step on the platform and watch and maybe sometimes get on the train, maybe get off the train, but this is God's train. This is his work. Now, you might believe I think there's not much for us Anabaptists to do, and I don't believe that for a minute. I think one area that we can be very intentional in addition to having the Bible in their own mother tongue is this thought of how much Christian literature and writings do we have access to? We have a tremendous pool of resources. I believe there are two things that the Anabaptist communities can do to best bless the indigenous church plants. And that is number one, carefully and prayerfully select a host of Christian literature that speaks to terms that are near and dear to us, whether that be loving your enemies or non-resistance or godly marriage or the list goes on and on and on. Translate it into their language and print it and have it available for them. It's a tremendous thing that we can do. The second thing I believe is, is just this, this ongoing discipleship. This ongoing discipleship. And that means maybe it's we're going to work for a week and we're going to have all the mornings are spent in spiritual teaching and the afternoons we're going to go visit community development projects. I don't know. 
but this ongoing, what does it mean? Why did Jesus say that? What do you think he meant? And resist giving answers from our culture because they're not, there are biblical principles identical, but how they live out is very different. I'd like to conclude with, in the 15 and 1600s, there was a burden to evangelize Indonesia. And missionaries came from the UK and England, moved there, built compounds, classic Christian missions of decades or centuries ago. Guess what? Today, Indonesia is a major Muslim country. And I believe one of the reasons is the Muslim traders, as they came from the big Muslim empires from the West, traded with the Indonesian people. And those, over time, somehow those Muslim traders shared something more than just trade, their faith. I believe the traditional worldview of going there and inviting people in will get us that result. May God help us. A few verses from Colossians to begin with here. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. A quote by Charles Brock, the planting of self-governing and self-supporting and self-expressing and self-teaching and self-propagating churches is not a far-fetched fantasy. When the Christian worldview becomes a living reality in the life of the church planter. That quote just really caught my attention. Um, I have thought in the past that the idea would be just, just to take three or four of our families, maybe five of our local church, and just move to China and start a church um, to reach out. We would show there by our life and by our preaching the gospel. We'd become Chinese and they'd become Christians. I know and personally have experienced some of that, but... This model of going like that in three or four or five large Anabaptist families today is not going to work very well. And there's a reason why many of these unreached people groups are still unreached. Um, we could say the low-hanging fruit is, has all been picked, easy places have been, been reached. What remains have barriers, political, geographical, cultural, and spiritual barriers uh, between us and them. The swarm or a colony model for church planting may have its place in our day, but not, it's not always feasible. For example, Southern Mexico, um, Mayangna community, Nicaragua, or even unreached tribes in Amazon are prime examples of how it wouldn't work to have five large Anabaptist families move into the community and start to try to do something. Um, these are places where the more the Pauline method where you have um, Apostle Paul and Silas going in be the better option. Keeping it low key. Yes, we want our teams to have support of fellow laborers. However, we need to be creative in finding ways to access these unreached areas and in, in supporting our church planters in these jungles or foreign fields. So what principles 
should we set forth for organization in partnering churches who are facilitating Bible translation and community development while working to establish indigenous churches? We suggest him modeling after the Apostle Paul. In conclusion, the planting of self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating churches that are not dependent on foreign resources, methods, or governance is our goal. This will need to be done with as few foreigners as possible and as inconspicuous as possible in light of the unreached people group context. Thank you, Brother Harold. Thank you, Brother Clyde. Thank you, Brother Jay. And thank you, Brother Ken. Look forward to the discussion part of this panel. Just two more slides before we jump into that to continue setting out the context that we're aiming toward. Just as a reminder, here at All Nations, we have a model that could be spoken of as a two-pronged fork or approach. All Nations and a partnering sending church, the two focuses are church planting and Bible translation. It's a joint project. We won't look to do one of those without the other. So Bible translation is what we focused on earlier in the week. This afternoon, we're focusing on the concept, the principles that would surround the vision of church planting. Brother Harold just spoke about unreached people groups, a Venn diagram that we've drawn here to help to illustrate this. You're welcome to look at the map if you care to, brothers. Uh, we have no Bible in some group contexts. We have no church in other contexts. Our laser focus as an organization, we feel called to specifically focus in our energy, our resources, is where those two sections overlap, no Bible and no church. And where Brother Harold and other of these brothers were, uh, what they were just speaking about, the reality that uh, in these contexts, there needs to be a strategic approach. We wanna highlight that here this afternoon. Uh, the unreached people groups are unreached for a reason. So indigenous church planting, what exactly do we mean by that? We've heard a little bit about that. Will it look different from your church? Questions for the panel. We're gonna have six or seven questions here. We actually collected these questions as we kind of sent out a survey to different of our field members and some of the questions even came from support team personnel. We appreciated the response that we got. We actually got an overwhelming response. It was hard to sift through all the information as we put out kind of a notice saying we're going to be looking at some specific questions here this afternoon. Does anyone have any feedback for us? When we think of the, the subject of tradition and innovation in church planting, we probably got 30 different questions and we chose six or seven of those. We're also going to be opening up at the end for questions from the floor. And I'll just uh, say ahead of time that we'd like you to keep those questions very concise. So if someone has a question that you can summarize, you please be prepared to stand to your feet. Maybe something that was said earlier this morning or here this afternoon that you would like to uh, challenge or agree with or maybe give a different angle on. So we certainly welcome that. Question number one that I'd like to us to consider here comes from a recent publication from Mr. Corey Anderson in his book, The Amish Mennonites Across the Globe. It's in the back. It's a, a beautifully done book. Mr. Anderson asked the following, what do cows and missions have in common? See some of you smiling. This was his answer. He said, missions. Among our Anabaptist people, I quote, the mission is the sacred cow we dare not question. Yet, the mission is the elephant in the room whose looming troubles we have difficulty acknowledging. So I'd like to hear a response than that from these brothers here. Uh, Brother Ken, I understand that uh, 10, maybe 15 years ago, you were asked to teach a class at Sharon Mennonite Bible Institute that was titled, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was titled something like Issues in Anabaptist Missions. Um, is Mr. Anderson being fair here? Is he being too critical when he says that we have an elephant in the room who's looming troubles we have difficulty acknowledging? Is that, yeah, I would like to hear you or any of the brothers here speak to that. Is, why has this become a sacred cow? Maybe Brother Ken, we'll start with you. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I think that if there are sacred cows, they should be sacrificed 
on the altar of a biblical approach. Amen. <laughs> However, that's kind of a, a, a new answer. I knew that. Um, so, how is, is Brother Corey being plenty critical? Is the, the elephant in the room, well, if the elephant in the room means that nobody's talking about missions because they're scared to touch the sacred cow, then I think maybe this conference is part of the answer. Because we are acknowledging that there are weaknesses and failures, and it's maybe time for new approaches. And I remember back in that missions class, uh, 18, 17, 18 years ago, we were discussing uh, the issues of uh, self-support, self-replicating, uh, and self-supporting. So I think these questions are being talked about in uh, healthy ways of, of uh, maybe uh, uh, taking care of the elephant. Uh, from my perspective, mm -hmm. they're being talked about. And also from the long-term missionaries that I've spoken to, the ones that I've spoken to seem to recognize that um, others are learners and they have, they have much to learn. So yes. that's my answer. Thank you. Appreciate that, Brother Ken. Any other comments or response to this uh, statement here from Dr. Corey Anderson? Clyde, Jay, or Harold? Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to encourage all of us here as we think about a statement like this in our beginning, our introduction to this session, to just take a deep breath. No one here is trying to form different sides. We're not looking to have a contest here between missions models. Uh, God forbid that there would be uh, looming troubles that we would not be willing to acknowledge. And as Brother Ken so well said, if there's a sacred cow in the room, let's, let's put up an altar. It's time to have sacrifice. So with that uh, comment, as we prepare to move in here, uh, let's, let's be willing to just openly engage. I think as Brother Ken said earlier today, we have a lot to learn from Anabaptist missions, a lot to learn. And we also want to be open and honest where there's troubles uh, and being willing to, to talk about those. This is an appropriate place to both acknowledge strengths and weaknesses that have been uh, maybe inherent in our mission efforts. Okay, the next question here came from a field member. He said, I think what Brother Ken will share about a disciplined brotherhood that makes collective application to scripture is key here. One of my questions would be, how can we, the expatriates, really allow the indigenous church to make collective application to scripture without our own voice coming through the loudest and the clearest? Uh, Brother Jay, would you care to respond to that? or any of you other brothers if he's not prepared with a response. You hear the question. Anyone, it's a fair, it's fair game. How can we keep from allowing our voice uh, to come through the loudest and the clearest? Even as we acknowledge, we want to see this group making collective application. What are some principles that could help to maybe throttle us back or some things to consider as we think about incarnational ministry? Anyone, go ahead. Well, I think about um, going into church planting as a learner. So if I go and I want to learn from the people that I am with, so that being, that translates into respect for their understanding. It also means, I think it would mean that there would be supreme um, Confidence in the Word of God as being sufficient. And confidence in the Spirit of God to guide that new believer with his level of understanding and the Spirit of God directing that brother or sister to understand how to make application. So, I want to mute myself to allow the Spirit of God to speak through his Word to a believer whom we have confidence in as an understanding has sufficient understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, or maybe a collective group of yes. believers. Yes, correct. Thank you, Brother Ken. Go ahead, Brother Jay. Uh, I think a phrase was said earlier today that strikes a chord with me, and that is, uh, we must teach and not tell. It must be taught, not told. You're not the rote learning. And a, a good strategy to use is, is asking questions. Jesus asked a lot of questions in his ministry, and he made people think about what he was teaching so that they could work that through and come to their own conclusions. Thank you. 
So Brother Clyde, I'd like to hear you comment on this, specifically as it relates to the context of salt. Why do you all not come in in your ministry with salt and kind of tell them how to do it? Uh, we're the Westerners. We have funds. Obviously, we have resources. Why, what would be wrong with that approach? Why, why would, what would be a principle that's helped to guide the vision of salt away from that towards something more, as Brother Jay just shared, more of a questioning approach? Can you unpack that a little? Sure. You know, I think one of the aspects is recognizing the poverty in my own life and knowing, wow, it's so easy for me to go to a different context and and see, wow, that doesn't line up with the word or if we're in a Christian context or this doesn't fit uh, the Bible or how I understand the Bible. But sometimes I ponder, would I be comfortable inviting the people I'm walking with to my home in America and stay for a day, stay for a week, stay for a month, stay for a year? Would, would I be okay with that? And, and, and can we see the areas um, that we perhaps don't line up with the word, uh, hmm. focus on consumerism, hmm. um, focus on food, gluttony. You know, there's areas that we have not done well in our Anabaptist settings. So does that mean we don't lift up the word and teach in foreign contexts? No, but it does give a sense of humility of, wait a minute, maybe I don't know what the answers are. But I think an even more profound view would be that I'm a foreigner. What I have the ability to do here are pretty minimal. And if anything that's going to sustain, they have to wrestle with it and find the solutions and the potential solutions. And yes, even allow them to go down the pain of what we think are very wrong choices because that's not a wasted opportunity. So those are some of the things sure. in community development in Seoul. Can we take that long view? Yes. Thank you, appreciate those responses. I think we'll move to our next question. It has been suggested, and I quote here, whether they realize it or not, every mission board will eventually need to decide the question of who will own the church. Will it be they themselves or the native people? Why does this need to be decided? Go ahead, Brother Jay. Well, this is something I, I feel strongly about, but uh, I feel that these kind of decisions should be made before a church sends somebody out, and before a missionary goes out, who's going to own the church? I think the better question here would be uh, when and how. But the decision of who's going to own the church, uh, you know, if we really come back to our scriptural basis on this, who is the builder of the church? Jesus Christ is the foundation, and he is the builder of the church. Well, yes, we work hand in hand with him, of course, but I think you understand what I'm getting at. We are partners. We are we, we work together in the spirit uh, with him as, as the church is built. And so there are other factors that relate to that question or the answer to that question as to how and when. Thank you. That's good. Anyone else care to comment on this question? I'll just make a comment here as far as the first question and the second question together. I think that part of the answer to the second question is, is, is held in the first question and that is how we relate with the local church. When I spent time in Southern Ukraine, often they come to me as a Western missionary who has the answers, who, ha who has the, I have the experience, and they wanted to ask me how I would do it. And often I'd push back on that. I'd say, well, let's discuss it. How do you think, how would you do it in your local context here? And get them to discuss how they would do this for, using their materials, using their ideas, their background, I said, why would I tell you how to do this? This is your local community. And then I would kind of guide the discussion as, as the leader in the church, but I really push back on giving my thought how I would do it. But guiding them to make their own decision, then I would support them as they made their decision. If it failed, I failed with them. If it was successful, I was successful with them. But it wasn't my decision. It was their decision. 
I support what they did. And that, I think, is a part of building up to releasing them, in a sense, to self-govern their own congregation, their own community, is to help them with that, in that journey. Thank you, Brother Harold. Appreciate that. And just back to touch on what Brother Jay shared, uh, he made mention that the question probably really should be, when and how does this need to be decided? Uh, hopefully not after the church plant is already getting started and we all of a sudden realize we have conflicting views on what it really looks like to be ascending church with missionaries on the field. And wait a minute, I thought this was going, you know, talking through those things ahead of time, I hear our brothers saying uh, definitely is, is valuable. Thank you for both of those comments. We're going to shift gears here a little bit. This is a longer statement. I'm going to read the whole statement. Many would argue that the use of brotherhood agreements and standards interferes with and replaces the work of the Holy Spirit in the individual. And that if there's sound teaching and a sincere love for the Lord, no agreements are needed. By and large, a disciplined church has rejected that argument in favor of mutual accountability between believers. Question. So, brothers, here's the question. If we share the gospel across cultural lines and focus on teaching, yet shy away from drawing conclusions for practical holy living, we've been hearing about that this morning, if we shy away from that in the host culture, depending instead on the Holy Spirit to birth the practical side of the Christian life into the conscience and life of the new believers, are we not applying the same reasoning that some would aim against a disciplined church structure here at home? It's actually a very good question. I'd like to hear all four of you reply to this question. Who would like to put your neck out and go first? Oh, yes. Um, I look at this question. Is it the same thing? And it would seem to be the same thing. Um, but is it possible that the principle of collective decision making could be part of the teaching of Scripture that would be brought to bear on a new church plan. So here's what the scripture teaches, brothers and sisters, how are you going to uh, come to a place where you make decisions together now for application to the scripture? And that may be easier um, if we can find the right people to do the teaching than in our society, because as we've heard multiple times today, uh, the Eastern Oriental societies are very much still a strong group uh, in, in their way of thinking. So, Thank you, Brother Ken. Appreciate that. Brother Harold, do you have a comment on this question? The Holy Spirit should always be a part of the development of the church in our, our personal lives as missionaries, church planters, community development workers, a part of our lives and as we work with locals we we expect the Holy Spirit to work among those people in that context and as we work with them and they come to faith in Christ we pray that the Holy Spirit will convict and guide but there's also the side of us teaching mm -hmm. teaching truth teaching from the scriptures um, the, Ho the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance things that we've taught. And Christ said that. Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't do all the work. We're called to do part of the work. And the Holy Spirit does its work through us and outside of us. Uh, so can we make, can we draw out practical applications to scriptures? Of course. Um, but I think we should be careful again mm -hmm. to be careful that we don't impose our applications from our local communities where we came from onto them. Guide them, help them, teach them. Thank you, Harold. Brother Clyde, you have a comment? So I have a bunch of questions. I don't know the answers, but is it possible to recognize that even though we're fluent in the language, seemingly understand many things from the local culture and have lived there five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or more, we will still always be foreigners. Hmm. So that limits us in practical application at times. In, in, is it possible to understand that every culture has things that are simply understood without being said? And what 
is understood without being said is different in every culture. You can't learn someone's language without learning about the people and all the perplexing things that you're working through. And one day, ah, the light bulb comes on. He says, now I understand why they say it that way or why that happens. And that happens in our own culture all day long, which is just simply normal. So is it possible to understand that making practical application Brotherhood agreements, holding each other accountable, can be very different in daily living in different cultures and both still be biblical. Is that possible? I think as foreigners, our best opportunity, like Brother Harold said, just keep lifting up the word. Why did Jesus say that? What does it mean? What does it mean to you? How do you understand that? I'll see you next month. I'll see you next quarter. Hmm. Be interesting to see how you've wrestled through that. I don't know. I, we need to simply lift up the whole word of God. I'm going to respond with a little example here because that phrase out there is underlined up there, drawing conclusions for practical holy living. When the Lancaster Conference Mennonites went to Tanzania in the 1930s, they were teaching the people there how to be separate from the world. And the, they were teaching them principles of modesty. And the, young, uh, the men were still wearing short pants. And uh, uh, the uh, advent of khaki uh, trousers was coming out from Britain. And they had, uh, with all the machines and everything, reduced the cost of it to where common people could afford it. So the missionaries broached the question. What about the cocky trousers? You know, you wanted to cover up those bare legs. And here's what the local people responded. They said, well, no, 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 no. That's a fad from the world that's coming in here from Britain. That's worldly. You see how intriguing this can get? I'll leave it with you. <laughs> okay, thank you for all those responses. Maybe I would just highlight yet that uh, we do want to draw practical conclusions for holy living. One of the biggest questions I hear these brothers emphasizing, is it us that draws it and hands them the decrees for to keep? Or do we have a collective study of the word of God? Next question is similar. We are not responsible for how others respond to the gospel, but are we responsible if we aim too low, expect too little, or, quote, leave to the Holy Spirit what God expected faithful men to command and exhort as part of the whole counsel of God? How accountable is the sending church and the church planter for the ultimate direction and position of the church it plants? Supposing they decide that short pants are okay, Brother Jay. How does the cultural sensitivity of indigenous church planting mesh with promoting the values God has blessed us to understand? And if we refuse to go beyond the letter of scripture, are we being true to our calling? Again, a very excellent question. Yeah. It these are hard things to wrestle with. You know, one of the things as I've studied people leaving a prior faith, animistic, Hinduism, Islam, and, and then when I was a Muslim, now I'm a follower of Christ, what do I do? And it's a joy to lift up the word. That's what Jesus said, so that's what you do. But one of the things that I find very difficult to understand is their lives are deeply, deeply integrated into this, uh, spiritual and faith-based practices and things. And it's very, very hard journey for someone to depart the former and embrace the new and say, okay, as a family, we've done that ever since I was a child. Is it still okay to do that as a follower of Christ? Uh, I don't know. What do you think? And there's so faith and standard practice of family life are so deeply integrated. It is a long, long journey for someone to wrestle with those things, perhaps the rest of their life. Perhaps that's what we need to do and look at, does that line up with the word of God? Is just because that's what we've always done? I don't know. I, 
I don't think that we need to be idle bystanders as they wrestle with these things. I don't think so at all. And I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. I think our heritage and practice of taking biblical principles and making group application to those principles is something that we need to share with humility. And yeah, lift up the whole Bible. If, if, if it's a Christian professing region and they've explained away, fill in the blanks that we hold dear, that's what it says, brethren. What will you do with that? And leave and just keep walking. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have said anything or not. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. I hear you saying we need to continue to wrestle rather than expect to just drop the hammer and say, well, we already wrestled with this and figured it out. Let's keep walking with them. I'd like to hear some more responses. The phrase here, leave to the Holy Spirit, seemed like a wrong phrase to me uh, because the Holy Spirit works in and through us as a, as a Christian worker, as a church planter. The Spirit of God is working through us. And so we are expected to preach and teach the gospel. And when it says lead to the Holy Spirit, that doesn't sound like a correct statement to me because that's actually like, what do we mean by that? Do you have the Holy Spirit in the church planner? Like, you, you are expected to share the gospel, to teach all things. That's the work of the Holy Spirit through me. Um, I recognize the Spirit of God works on people too, but we're expected hmm. to do something. So Brother Harold, I'm gonna be really practical here. Let's suppose you're working in Africa. Just forget that Brother Jay is sitting here for a minute. And you've just baptized a group of new believers. And maybe in their culture, they have some longer short pants, down to the knee, let's say. And in your culture, that wouldn't be modest. And I appreciate that value. But uh, are you suggesting that uh, we should view leaving to the Holy Spirit to teach them something about that? That's a non sequitur, like we're actually talking about a that's a false argument that shouldn't even be, that's not a phrase we should use in this whole discussion. How would you respond? Is it okay to baptize a group of believers that haven't yet reached college level maturity? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I want to hear some practical dialogue here. Anyone else can feel free to respond as well. I don't wait to send my child to school till it's college. I enter him in school when he's first grade. He's enrolled in school. Um, as far as your practical application, as far as the short pants, um, I would begin to pray and to fast and to pray about that issue, that specific issue in that culture. And at some point, I believe God's Spirit would probably tell me to go say something about that. That's from my perspective. Thank you. Go ahead, Brother Jay. You're what back about, on the stage. What about Peter, the disciple of Christ, who stripped down to go to work, and he put on his garment when he presented himself to the Lord? Uh, I'm just throwing that in there, you know, make it interesting, but uh, I believe we really need to look at something here very, very important, and that is the change that Jesus Christ brings to the heart of a person and the repentance and the changing in where they're walking and what they're focusing on. A lot of these things take time to follow after. And I think, you know, granted, we'll, some of us here will draw the lines at different places as to how we're going to handle this. But let's not lose sight of the fact that it's all about the heart and so on. Okay, thank you for both of those responses. Ken or Clyde, do you, either of you care to weigh in on this question or even the practical application here that Jay threw out as the discussion starter? Appreciate that. Any further comments? Jay, I heard you saying that we might have a scriptural case for a disciple that wasn't fully clothed. Now, we um, could argue that he wasn't yet converted, but uh, I think you'd probably have a pushback on that too. Yeah, I'm not making that case. Okay. <laughs> Any additional comments, specifically thinking about teaching the whole counsel of God? 
What does this look like? If we refuse to go beyond the letter of Scripture, are we lowering the bar too far? Maybe you could think about, uh, in this case, particular illustration, Jesus' commission to his disciples. As you go, make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I appreciate that, Brother Ken. So what I hear you suggesting is that maybe when we baptize them, Brother Jay said it's about a transformation of heart. That's really what we're looking for, but we're not going to stop there. There's going to be an ongoing discipleship beyond the baptismal waters. And uh, in talking with uh, Brother Mark Yoder about, in his response to, to me about some of these questions, of course the, the issue of clothing and clothing standards always comes up in our discussions because it's, it's a big deal to us Mennonites. He said, yeah, he said, we've learned to maybe focus, we've learned that the real issues for many new converts are much, much more complex. For example, uh, how does a husband learn to love his wife or control his children or pay back a, a debt that he promised to pay yesterday but he doesn't have the money for? There's all these complex areas of discipleship that need work, that need much patience. And yes, we'll probably go ahead and baptize that brother, even if he is in trouble with his wife sometimes, and fights with her, because he's sincere and he, he's growing in the Lord, and there's going to be growth in that particular area. So that's my answer. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's a practical application that uh, I've heard one of these brothers share, who's sitting up here working in a context where there were new believers who were preparing for baptism. And I believe there's different ways we can go on this. Again, the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is what I hear these brothers calling us to. But um, this brother said that uh, they actually got out the Word of God and they brought out to these sisters who were preparing to enter the waters of baptism the comments from 1 Peter and also from Timothy about adornment. And they didn't tell them, you have to strip off your jewelry before we'll baptize you. But they just unpacked those, those teachings. And when they got to the waters of baptism, praise God, the jewelry was gone. And it's not come back to this day. So we're not saying there's a right or a wrong way to do this. It's a transformation of heart and teaching the word of God before baptism and for sure after. We need both. You know, as, as an aside, um, I guess there's some evidence that in the early church, they actually baptized people with all their clothes removed, or very nearly so. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, I guess, baptizing someone with long pants down to the knees wouldn't be quite that extreme. However, I like to add just a little something to my earlier statement. The reality is the church planter is sort of in the middle of two worlds. Mm -hmm. He's helping the new church. He's also connected to the old church. Right. And if he understands that there is an, an item or an issue of discussion he is connected to his sending church, and so he may actually bring an item that will have a lot of symbolism attached to it, uh, and and talk to uh, talk to his connections back home. I'm saying this this is one way to um, make sure there is not disunity in the body of Christ. When you say he may bring an item that may have a lot of symbolism attached to it. Can you clarify what you okay. mean there? So if my home church would have trouble with baptizing this guy in that kind of attire, mm -hmm. I would probably want to listen to some counsel as to how to proceed. Mm -hmm. I know we're talking about this connection between the, the sending church, the board, and, and the, um, the, um, the new church plant. But that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Ken. Excellent. So we're not just out there on our own making decisions. We're working under authority. Appreciate that very much. Anyone else care to comment on that? Yeah, I think we have to have understanding from the home church as well. I'll just use a very simple example. Um, I appreciate people tucking their shirts in. You know, that's just the way I was taught. That's the way I grew up. When I went to Indonesia, uh, in a hot climate, everybody wears their shirts outside. You know, that was something I needed to get used to, but that's their culture. Uh, we have these different values that we really need to bring into discussion. And uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there.
Sure. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on to our next question. With a view to 2 Timothy 2, 8 to 21, and 3, 14 to 17. So you're welcome to flip your Bible open to those two passages if you have one on your lap. Is knowing the scriptures coupled with historical contextual teaching of them enough to provide a foundation for a relationship between the planter waterer sending church and the new planting followers of Jesus? If the answer is no, then what is the basis for biblical saving faith? So 2 Timothy 2, 8 to 21, several of us were together last night in the auditorium here preparing for this. We looked at both of these passages. Uh, Brother Jay, were you prepared to just comment on, just do a summary, what is this passage? Or Brother Ken, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 to 17. Either of you, when you're ready, uh, just for the sake of our audience here, what would you say is the thesis statement? If you had to summarize it in two or three phrases. Well, the verse here in, in the second two passage, Second Timothy 2 passage, I would say that the pivotal verse and the key verse is that uh, verse, uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's uh, verses before and after that tie into that, the importance of being faithful to the Lord, to the word of God, and enduring. And there are other verses following it and that are intertwined in that passage that talk about our horizontal relationships with, with people, you know, with the world and uh, avoiding empty chatter and so on and so forth. So the, the you know, it's, it's the vertical, it's the horizontal, but we're all anchored in, in the scripture. The word of God. Yeah. Thank you. Brother Ken. Okay, in 2 Peter chapter 3, 16, 17, familiar scripture. The scripture is given and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The sufficiency of scripture here, I think, is what we see. Okay, thank you. So again, looking at specifically this question, with a view to these two particular passages, we could add others, but this, this, these are the two that came with the question, is teaching, knowing these scriptures coupled with historical contextual teaching, enough to provide a foundational relationship between the planter water ascending church and the new planting of followers of Jesus? Second question, if the answer is no, what is the basis for biblical saving faith? So who cares to respond? Basis for saving faith, biblical saving faith, is found in the Word of God. And so we, we know of communities that they, they keep a lot of different rules and, and they have these practical applications, and they're keeping them all to the T. They're actually living all these external rules, but they're, they're not saved. Mm -hmm. They're not born again. I, I think there are all the, some that are, but... In, this, in these two passages, we see that, that saving faith is based upon the living Word of God, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Thank you. Who else cares to respond? Well, in practical reality, um, as I think about our relationship with um, our dear brother Jacob and his work in Kerala, India, um, we, I would answer in, in, in relationship to that partnership I would answer this question yes that's how we're handling it I'm sorry that's good was that clear? was my answer yeah. clear? so with your relationship with the church plant that you're involved with in India and the brother there which question are you answering is yes of the two questions okay I'm, I'm saying that, so the scriptures coupled with historical contextual teaching of them is enough to provide a, a um, relationship between him and God and his people. So that same scripture, that same historical context, I think that would imply maybe some, some uh, thousand year tradition or some, obviously there's, there's been church councils, there's been, there's been creeds and things established way back there that might come along with our understanding of the scriptures. So, and he understands those too. They're implied kind of in Christian doctrine. Like items like the Trinity, um, all that sovereignty of God, so forth. So, um, yes, I believe that that connection to the Word of God and what is implied there is enough for a connection between him and us. Okay. And as it all works out, we end up with pretty much the same convictions. And... Many of the same 
practical applications or variations because of climate and culture and the way they do things in southern India. Okay, thank you. Excellent, appreciate that response. Who else cares to give a comment to either what Brother Ken shared there or to the original question? I'm sorry, I must not have understood the question. No, you did. You, you answered very well. Okay, okay, thank I you. Guess. You're answering yes. Uh, yes. This view to scripture coupled with historical contextual teaching is enough for the relationship between the sending church and the church that's being planted. We don't have to add 25 more things and say, if you don't meet these non-negotiables, then somehow we can't do church together. But we're not saying that we're not going to call those people to also make practical application in their own way. Amen. The early church at Jerusalem handled the issue with relating with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. They had a council, they discussed it, and they said, well, let's do four things. Let's require just four things of them, and then we'll have a good, a good relationship. Well, I think that's a good example of what we're speaking of here. Okay, thank you, Harold. Who else care to comment on that? I guess I have a question. Should the relationship between the planter and the and the uh, the church, the indigenous church, be the issue of focus? Isn't that a temporary relationship at best? Mm -hmm. You hear the question. Uh, isn't that a temporary relationship at best? And should it even be the focus? What if it is the focus, though, and it is a major concern? I hear you pushing back on that a little bit, Brother Clyde, and saying really that probably shouldn't be our primary focus. Appreciate that. Well, reaching back to question four, how come was the sending church and the church planted for the ultimate direction position of the church at plant? I got to thinking about the Christian family. We do all we can in the limited amount of time that we're with our children to try to set the direction of their lives, to teach them, to teach them uh, right kinds of beat behaviors that are the principle and also teach them how to make their own decisions once they're on their own but ultimately we give them up to god that's it's all we can do mm -hmm. we, if we not, we're not able to release them to uh, walk their own pathway in life we're going to get gray hair prematurely and maybe that's why i have <laughs> <laughs> okay, i really appreciate that example of walking with your children we'll expect them to be children but we're walking with them we're expecting them to grow we're expecting them to mature, and eventually we're releasing them from that father-to-son relationship, or else we'll get gray hair really fast. Thank you, Ken. Bemoaning the Anglican missionary efforts of the late 19th and earliest 20th century, Roland Allen writes, We have begun by imposing a system of external rules, and we cannot easily go back. In the beginning, it would have been comparatively easy to have avoided, to have avoided the difficulty to have baptized men without insisting that they first accept our laws, to have established churches and native villages under their own elders without breaking up their social order would no more have been a lowering of our standard of morality than the establishment of kindergarten class in a school is lowering of the standard of education of the school. It is one of those fearful acts of faith in Christ, which Christ at times demands of his followers. It is one of those acts of abandonment of our own righteousness which makes the way for the revelation of his power. Did I hear anyone say amen? Or did I hear some questions in your minds? What do we think about this statement? A pretty frank uh, brother of uh, Roland Allen in his uh, usual candid style isn't beating around any bushes. He just uh, goes straight to the point whether we agree with him or not. And I don't always. I did want to bring this uh, statement here and hear some Here's some discussion. There's a number of thoughts here that could be lifted out. Before I point out any of those, any of you have comments? I'd love to hear your response just as a, a knee-jerk reaction. What, what do you think about this quote? I think we all understand that having rules and guidelines and, direct, and parameters is important. But I think we will all probably agree as well that they're not necessarily going to shape the heart and the heart attitude. There's other things involved in all of that. And so, you know, in our teaching, and we're appealing to the Spirit oftentimes, and to the Word of God, we have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, to appeal to the principles uh, of the things we're teaching. And, you know, when you're walking with someone on a road, uh, 
they tend to become like the person that's discipling them in adopting a lot of things, including practical things as well. And so it comes back, I think, to what we were talking about earlier, of walking together. And so I do believe we should focus on the principles, but there is going to be a place to set some guidelines. What do you think of the analogy that Roland Allen is using here of comparing the context of a schoolroom, beginning with kindergarten up through whatever grade, uh, to the, he's using that in a parabolic way, thinking of the context of church planting. Is that a fair analogy? Is it a good analogy? Anyone have a comment on that? I'm trying to understand the question still. Uh, what is he actually saying by that analogy? He's bemoaning. He, I don't know that he's uh, so much raising a question per se, other than challenging the status quo uh, that he found within the Anglican church during the late 19th and early 20th century, challenging the status quo that he was familiar with in his context where we're requiring people first to accept our laws, our standards, and then we establish churches and native villages, but um, we're totally breaking up their social order. And uh, in the context here, he speaks about sending uh, their young men off to do seminary training, and then we bring them back and set them over the village because now they are trained in our, in our understanding of Christianity. But he's saying, folks, we really, something's gone wrong. So he's saying they should ordain the village elders rather than sending their young men off to seminaries, to the English seminaries, and come, have them come back and lead the villages. Is that what he's saying? I think that's one of the arguments he's making. Yes, that's a... Well, that might have some parallels to the question we could ask uh, about leadership in the indigenous church. Like, should uh, the Americans be the pastors for a while until they train someone else in? Or should they immediately ordain the elders. Mm -hmm. Okay, you brothers heard the question. Um, I think that's an excellent uh, kind of bridging off of this. That's an excellent tie-in. So Brother Clyde, Brother Harold, Brother Jay, what do you think about the concept of having the expatriate be the first pastor and then eventually ordaining or uh, maybe not ever being the pastor. We're actually more of a nurturer, a teacher, a discipler. We wait till there's someone there who's mature enough before we have an elder that's kind of functioning as a, the leader in that church. It's a good question, Brother Ken. Who would care to respond? I wouldn't mind hearing Clyde respond to that. because He might have some, some, uh, some recent experiences. I think the fact is there's, there's, there's so many variables in every context that you simply need to cry out to God to find a way. As I have studied the missions I've walked with, I've heard the thought of we'll be pastors for a period and when they're ready, we will they will become the leaders. And so now, when is that? It's a, bit, it's a very slippery slope in my experience, but I don't know. I don't think at all we're idle bystanders. But in my experience, there, there's this idea that whether they're ordained or not and have the official charge, usually there is someone that has come to the faith in the community and then there's another and another and they are gathering together and they're starting to do all things of the scripture. So you might call them a de facto leader for a period of time. But at what point do you just simply go to the scripture? In my personal devotions this morning in Acts, and they ordained. When are they ready? That's a very hard question, but Acts isn't silent on these topics. I like the word that uh, is used in the in our ABT uh, core values, mission statement, etc., of being f to facilitate. 
there's lots of ways to facilitate. You know, you can be alongside, you can be coaching from behind the scenes, uh, you can be up front teaching. And, and I do come back to what you were saying. We really need to listen to the spirit on this. But I really like the idea or the concept or the picture of apprenticeship in a trade or of raising children. Again, coming back to that. And that is, we, know, we don't, when we're apprenticing somebody in a trade, uh, we don't teach them everything and then all at once we come to a point where we're saying, okay, now everything is yours, it's a decision. It's a process that you walk through of increasing responsibility, of increasing decision making, of, uh, of giving it over little by little until you have complete confidence that that person knows how to do whatever product you're working on by themselves. And this would include for us as church planters, uh, being able to rightly divide the word of truth and having spiritual maturity, leading the church, you know, and all of the above. Excellent. I appreciate that. Ken, I'd like to hear you respond to your own question here in a moment. A uh, comment I'll throw in here, the bouncing off of that, is that uh, if we go back to one of our earlier questions, uh, Brother Ethan actually asked the question, how can we keep our own voice from coming through the loudest and the clearest? I think it's something he's concerned about in his quiet village context where the people are looking at him as maybe someone that has all the answers. So if he would take the traditional Western view of a pastor and come in there and tell them, this is how we do church, is that appropriate? Or should he actually take a few steps back and rather try to encourage and mentor, leading alongside or from behind? I like those two word pictures. That's excellent. Brother Ken or Brother Harold, either of you have a comment yet on this excellent question? Well, I'm thinking of the fact that we do have some scriptural precedent in that Paul said we shouldn't ordain novices. Mm -hmm. I guess that, that would be the question. What is a novice? And also we have the example of Paul mentoring Timothy and taking along men with him on his journeys so that they might observe him. So it seems that there again, you, the difference is there he had men who were near culture to him. He could communicate to them. And there wasn't maybe as great of a divide as going from a Western culture to a South American culture. How do you train a man whose language you hardly know? That's the big question I have. I think, biblically speaking, this part of turning the, over, 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 the ownership of the new church to the, to the people would be to have their own elders. And again, coming back to our example with our brother we're working with in India, our dear brother Jacob, for all these years, he's not been able to ordain men back in those travel areas where mostly women are believers because there aren't many men who come to the faith. So the best they've been able to do over the years is to circulate, teach, preach, and hope that one day there might be uh, young men raised up. And right now there's a couple young men in the village where Jacob is. Uh, they were, they're kind of stuck there because of COVID. So they're taking the opportunity now to preach and, and what they're, to train those young men, hopefully to send them back and raise up elders. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're facing these complexities mm -hmm. back there yeah. in Mario. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't really have the answers. Mm -hmm. It would be easier if I would be working, if I was the church planter and my disciple would be an English speaking pastor of my culture, it would be much easier. But how do you do it cross-culturally? I do not know. Thank you for those responses. I think of the example of uh, in Etel. If you watch the second chapter, it talks about how that Brother Mark Zook, after the people who came to faith in Christ in his village context, came to faith, one of the first things he challenged them with was what are you going to do with this reality, this, this faith you now are experiencing? They were so excited. He challenged them. He said, there's other people out there. What are you going to do about that? And it really stopped their, their uh, celebration for a bit. And uh, they said, we, what do you mean? He said, well, someone needs to go and tell them. And they got this, this distressed look. They're like, we can't do that. Mark said, it's okay. I'll go with you. I'll help you. But I'm not going by myself. We're going to do it together. In village A, he did all the teaching. In village B... He helped them, and they helped him. By village C and D, he had them, though it made them extremely uncomfortable, in the front, doing the teaching. And eventually, he faded out of the picture. I think that's kind of what I hear you brothers 
alluding to at least. It won't always be the same in every context. There's different contexts. We need to have brothers who are able to lead, but um, it's good. Any other comments? Maybe I could just add in here on a word on church uh, discipline from examples in Ghana, you know, by Polygamy is a problem over there, taking a second wife often time. This may be jumping ahead a little bit, but um, once you have local leaders in place, uh, it's, it's easier to deal with that than when you don't. But one of the things they discovered is they needed to set up some guidelines this, for this. That when people would come into church uh, and they would be member, baptized members, after a while some of them would revert and want to take a second wife. And they had to set down uh, church discipline there. Uh, and, and if a person did that, they would excommunicate them or put them under discipline. And they had to be very firm with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that set a, a, um, an example for them and for the other churches in the community around there that this is what was going to happen. And it took time to work through that, uh, you know, a number of years. Mm -hmm. But things like that uh, and, uh, uh, need to be put in place so that you, you, can, you can keep things going where they need to go. And sometimes, uh, yeah, you really need local confidants to do that. So, but sometimes the missionary has to act as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Jay. Excellent. Okay, that was our last question. Technically, we only have 15 minutes left, but if, there, if we get a good discussion going, we might dismiss people who want to eat supper and the rest of us will stay here and we'll just kind of have fellowship together. We'll see. It is time for you to speak up. So we're gonna actually take one of these mics uh, Brother Clyde, could we sacrifice your mic here? Jordan, do you mind being the mic man that runs around and delivers it to people? Thank you. So just raise your hand, flag it up here like this. If you have a question you'd like to ask, maybe something you heard you misunderstood or something you'd like to hear clarified, or maybe something that wasn't addressed that you were hoping would be addressed. Have a question back there in the back. Feel free to just put your hand high when you have a question and we'll get you a mic. And we'll look forward to hearing these brothers respond. Is there a way to share our culture's experiences and knowledge from a standpoint of it being a cultural perspective, just as we should learn from other cultures? Can we share that with the culture we go to without being perpetually frightened of importing foreign ideas to their detriment? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Brother Ryan. Who cares to respond? I think it's very important when you go there, as was said earlier today, to go there as a learner. And part of going there as a learner is to find a, what you might call a cultural guide, a confidant, somebody who's gonna be open and honest with you. And that's a real challenge because initially people are gonna tell you what they think you want to hear and all that kind of thing. And it takes time to develop that kind of a relationship, but that's one way or maybe part of the answer. I, my mind immediately went to uh the fellowship meals over at Dunmore East Christian Fellowship. In Ireland now, they have a lot of folks that have come to Ireland from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And about once a month, we had a fellowship meal, American, uh, Romanian, Welsh, mm -hmm. British, uh, what other, a bunch of different international cuisines. I know this is not possible for every setting, but one way to address that would be to have a, just sort of a cultural fair or feast where you come together and you actually decide to celebrate uh, the cultures and mm -hmm. eat meals together, share some, some of your perspectives on food and embrace them with, with delight. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but I guess maybe sometimes that's easier said than done, uh, eating food you're not used to. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there should be a way to, I think that's a great idea, is a way to build bridges to kind of celebrate mm -hmm. the, the, the variations, the features of the respective cultures. Thank you, Brother Ken. Appreciate both of those responses. Ryan, do you have a comeback? Does that answer your question? Does it scratch the itch at all? Yeah, it does. I think I was thinking a little more in the, in, maybe along the lines of Jay's uh, question there of finding someone you can relate to to figure out how that culture is going to take what you're sharing. Um, I, I feel like we could possibly um, emphasize the indigenous aspect to the exclusion of sharing what we have to share, rightfully so, um, and to actually be a blessing to them. Um, and maybe, yeah, I think that's kind of where it's coming from. That makes more sense. Thank you. Have a hand up here, Jordan. 
response to that? Over here, Adam, and then over to Billy. I, I agree that it's good to go in as a learner, but I think one of the things that we can bring is a unique perspective. I think this may be what you're getting at, is we will see things in the culture that they are blind to, just like they see things in our culture that we are blind to. And I think we need to be able to share that as well. Um, we do want to be careful about imposing culture, but there are certain uh, just plain sinful activities that people are blind to in every culture. And a lot of times it takes an outsider to see those and, and to point them out and bring them to the attention. Now, we may leave it more with the uh, local church leadership to figure out the exact solutions to those, um, but a lot of times they don't even see it. And they need the help of an outside perspective to see it. Just like you've been talking about uh, when we interact with other organizations, they, there's things that they do well and they can help us with, and there's things that we do well and we can help them with. It's the same cross-cultural uh, interaction. And I wonder if uh, we need to have, be willing to point out those blind spots in a, in a loving way and, and have our own blind spots pointed out to us. I, I guess that's, maybe that's not a question. That's good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Brother Billy. Yeah, thank you. I had two que or a question on two different subjects up there. Um, first one about the toward the end, we were talking about at what point does the missionary stop pastoring the church and turn it over to the indigenous local believers? And I had the question came to my mind. Um, when Paul sent Timothy to ordain elders in, in all the churches, who was at that time and up until that time leading those churches? Were there other uh, Judeans and Jews or Christian established Christian pastors had been sent there and were missionaries to that place? Or were those groups of people finding their own leadership kind of organically as they sprung up amongst believers and if I'm not mistaken, Apollo ended up was one of those kind of leaders. If I'm not wrong, I might be wrong about that. But I guess that's, that's one of my questions. I guess not coming from an Anabaptist style background, I wonder, well, maybe this is a strong statement, but is there arrogance in the idea that we, we need to be the leadership and that and that's I guess the question on the board is the spirit of God and the word of God and cultural context understanding of history um, and even that's I guess debatable is that sufficient to raise up a church organically or must we to what extent, I guess that's what the debate's about or the question, to what extent must we impose or lead or take responsibility for? And, and so that's one question. The other thing was, when I asked the question earlier, are we talking about a building? And the answer was no. So what are we talking about? And if, if we're talking about people, right? Church is people. I'm really confused by the question and the terminology who owns these people? And what do we mean by that? I mean, are we not? Um, it, it might also actually kind of be the same question, the two, the two subjects, maybe. But what do we actually, I don't understand the question. What, what do we mean when we say who owns the church? If we're not talking about a building. I mean, I understand a piece of property and boards and bricks and mortar, but are we talking about who has command and authority or are we talking about who gets to tell who what to do or what I mean that's what ownership means in my understanding but what's the understanding of the word ownership that I don't understand that I'm missing okay I'd like to hear some of you respond to that even though none of you crafted the question uh, if you don't have a response I have one but I'll let you speak first thank you brother Billy two two great comments and Finishing up with a question there. Who cares to reply? 
when we talk about the church and think of ownership from our context here, what, what is that? Is it authority and command? Is that what we're talking about? What do we mean? I think that it would include that. Control, authority, command. Too often it's been that way. It's been that way where the missionary is wanting to control and make the decisions for the local people. And in that sense, they own the church. It's, it's their church versus allowing the local people make decisions, plan how they want to do their, you know, many different, very practical applications, how they're going to do it. Who's going to own it, them or us? In my, my, in my mind, I was seeing this. We have missionaries who go to certain areas, build a church house, and then we call people to our church. Do you want to be a part of my church? Versus going in and beginning to work with people, um, teaching them all things, and having them, guiding them to begin having their own local meetings, local services, times together. And it's not my church. It's their, the local church. I'm helping them build their church. That's Appreciate that response, Harold. I think that's, that's well said. Does that help to answer the question, Billy? Well, I didn't make it up. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually a question that, from my context, I fully understand. But I can appreciate the dilemma that I'm sensing that you're feeling when you actually hear that question. It actually is kind of a wake-up call for me because I understood immediately what this bishop, who actually framed the, the question, he works on a missions board, what he meant when he said that, I got it immediately. You're like, so uh, I can appreciate that that dilemma and maybe it's helping to expose as we've been trying to do this week some areas that we maybe are it's not a wrong question yeah, we but now you have to help me i have no idea what a blm rally is okay <laughs> there you go yeah okay excellent thank you brother billy another hand who has another question back there in the back brother dave so in the uh, context of church practice and um, application and all that, so we had the thing with the shorts and the long pants. Um, so at what point is the me wanting them to wear long pants a sacred cow that I need to sacrifice in order to have them proceed with church or in order to give them, give the church over to their authority and their way of how they believe it should be run. Okay. I'm not going to attempt to answer that. I'll look to these other brothers to weigh in there. Thank you for the question, Dave. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, actually. Who would like to speak to that? One of the best examples that I know of to, as a response to that question is the book called Bruchko. I'm not sure if you're aware of the book or not, but that in that book you have people that were used to actually living without clothes. And when he taught them, began to share the gospel, they began to clothe themselves. It wasn't like our clothes, our modesty today in our church, but it was better than what they had been. I call that modesty in their context. They weren't wearing long pants and you know, button-up shirt, but it was much better than being totally naked. Mm-hmm. Well, if I can be a bit vulnerable over there and you came around and looked in my backyard, sometimes you would probably see me wearing short pants. Now, I don't know if you're going to write me off because of that or not, but when it's tropical heat and I'm working in my farm or whatever I'm doing, I understand why people wear short pants over there. But whenever I go out of my house or out into town, I don't go that way because that's not the kind of thing I want to portray. Mm -hmm. So it comes back again to context, I think, and, uh, you know, are we imposing our values on them? What is modesty to them? We need to ask those kind of questions, ask ourselves the questions, asking them the questions. And you know, in Tanzania, yes, they did eventually wear long trousers, but it wasn't an issue that had to be answered that day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, appreciate that. If I would roll my shirt sleeves up here a bit and expose my elbow, <laughs> none of you would freak out. 
But if I would stand on top of that table where the uh, projector is and do the same thing with my pants, I have a feeling that it would be a cultural shock that some of you are, are looking, some of these brothers don't get what I'm talking about. Those of us who grew up in an Anabaptist context know right away. But I hear maybe the question being raised here by Brother Jay and Brother Harold is depending on your context, really it does make a difference on how we understand something as simple as an elbow versus a knee. Is that too simple? I'm not trying to make a statement, I'm raising a question. Let's, let's, let's think through our preconceived ideas. I appreciate the fact that my father uh, actually taught me to wear long pants and he prefers a long shirt. And because of that, when possible, I wear a longer sleeve instead of even a shorter one. In a context like this, he actually would prefer, even though I'm no longer under his tutelage, he would prefer that I wear a long sleeve shirt. I have no problem with the brothers in here who wore shirt sleeve shirts today, but is it possible to acknowledge that we have some cultural expectations that come along with things like modesty that maybe aren't just as cut and dry as we would be potentially led to believe? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Over here, Brother Daniel. So I think uh, some of the, <clears throat> my own journey as pertains to owning the work, I, I think of the, the harling and the, what is it, the harling and the owner, the harling flees when the wolf comes. So there's a sense of ownership, I think, that we must have. So I guess my question is, now that that weight is on us, that ownership, you know, um, I wrestle a lot with some of the things that were discussed, not so much in knowing the lines, but in how to imply them or how to teach. And I don't know if that's, it, I, we serve in a, in a um, country where it's very, you don't confront people, you know. You don't speak something directly to their face. And so I notice it's very hard to confront things. And so I'm, I'm wrestling with that. I don't know if somebody has some ideas on how to actually. So when you see something with a, with a new believer, mm -hmm. how do you? I, I, know, I, I know what I need. You know, I, I know what the Bible says, but how do you? How do you address? How do you disciple when you see an area of need in a new believer? So probably have to be our last question. Who would like to comment? How do we disciple? How do we engage when we see an area of need? Maybe it's the long pants, or maybe it's something else. We'd like to continue to see growth. How do we address those things in an appropriate way? I think we do need to do what you're asking, uh, what you're suggesting here, Brother Daniel. We don't just float along and hope that the Holy Spirit teaches them all things. Jesus said that we're supposed to teach. How is that done in an appropriate way? Who cares to come in? I, I think um, a lot of these questions, we need to wrestle with them. But when the brother in the back asked, when's it okay to bring our culture? My immediate thought, why would I ever bring my culture to a context? Is that even right to do? I'm not sure that it is. And then I was thinking about so these examples of dress or modesty, things like that. And then Daniel's question around or thought around, when's it okay to offend? That's really the gist of it. I'd say culture matters. Culture absolutely matters. So endeavoring to find the most culturally appropriate way to offend for one reason, for the gospel. In other words, if, if we start looking at modesty, for example, or Adam said sin, so I think all of us, if it's sin, let's lift up the word of God. And, and how do you do that? Question, somebody said earlier, just asking questions. Just keep asking questions. Just keep asking questions. I think is a very effective way. So the question is, are we willing to offend for culture reasons? But I'd say no. Are we willing to offend for the gospel? I think yes. So I don't know. It just, I think a lot of these things can be, can be if they're looked through the lens of 
for whatever reason, the country leadership is overthrown, you got one day to get out of the country, and you never have hope to return again. Got to leave right now. You're going to the airport, and they're escorting you out. You'll never see the brothers that you've walked with, cried with, and practiced the emblems with. You'll never see them again. What are your regrets? What do you wish you would have done differently? Change the story. You got one year. What will you do? What will you work on first? I think if a lot of these things are viewed through that lens, this idea of an indigenous church that is able to practice all things of the New Testament body in a sustainable way, if that's the goal, then when it's viewed through the lens of I gotta leave tomorrow, what are my regrets? Change the story, I got one year, what will I do? Thank you, appreciate that, Brother Clyde. Any last comment from any of the other brothers before we have closing prayer? Brother Ken, it looks like something's on, on your mind. Go ahead. Well, I don't know that this is a fair comparison or not, but I was drawn to Paul's exhortation to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. And I don't know if it's fair to apply to, a, to our kind of church planting endeavor, but it does speak into the burden that any, any uh, discipler should have for his people. And um, he said to the Ephesian elders, he said, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and the Greeks, dependence toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows now he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to face persecution. But he doesn't count those things dear to himself. And he says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed to how you feed the flock of God, because grievous wolves are going to come. And he says, Therefore watch and remember that this, by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God mm. and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Amen. It seems to me here we see the burden and the labor of the church planter, mm -hmm. but there comes a time when he lets go. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can define exactly what, what that time is. I don't think we can. It varies from context to context. Mm -hmm. But there, this speaks to the heart of church planting, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Well and, said. Thank you, Brother Ken. We hope you have been blessed through this discussion. If you are interested in additional resources, here are a few we recommend. The first is a chapter from Have We No Rights, a book by Mabel Williamson of the China Inland Mission. In her book, this chapter is called The Right to Run Things. It teaches a lesson through a story of two cross-cultural church planters who followed very different principles. On our blog, we have posted an abridged version, called Beavers or Trainers. Second, the article titled Plant or Transplant was born out of a discussion about church planting principles at our annual board and advisors meeting in 2020. You can read this article unpacking the principle of indigenous church planting on our blog. Third, a mandatory paradigm shift sounds a clear call to align our motivations in Bible translation with the mission of God in the world. Read this blog post to find out what happens when Bible translation efforts are divorced from the vision of church planting and the commission Jesus gave us to make disciples. The fourth resource we recommend is a video recording of Steve Sanford, who served with Ethnos 360 in Venezuela, telling the story of planting an indigenous church among the Hoti people. There are a lot of important lessons we can learn from this story on the resources page of our website. Fifth, the team at Access Truth has put together a series of church planting case studies that we have found helpful. The 22 tutorials include a number of interviews with church planters at various stages of the process around the world. You can find the church planting case studies module at accesstruth.com. Sixth, and finally, we recommend the message our brother Ken Miller preached prior to the panel discussion you just watched. 
find this message for today's Anabaptist church planners on our YouTube channel or website. It's called The Pilgrim Church, a Disciple-Making Community. We've placed links to all of these resources in the description below this video. Thank you again for watching, and God bless you.